But when it comes to the budget, we focus on the general city budget and that excludes those three departments which are called proprietary. So the general city budget, it consists of special funds and the general fund and the special funds have restrictions on their use while the general funds made up of city revenue without specific restrictions. So we'll dive into these a bit more in a few moments. Uh, for comparison, the slide here shows the breakdown of funds for our current fiscal year 21-22, which began last July and goes through June 30th of this year. On the right, you can see the general breakdown of how each dollar is spent with the largest chunk you'll see going toward community safety, followed by home and community environment, which covers services like solid waste collection and transportation, which covers traffic control and, and a lot of things they use every day um, out in our built environment. Uh, slide three. Uh, so where do these $11 billion come from? The majority is from the general fund revenue, which is made up of various economically sensitive taxes, including the list here on the right. Uh, what that means is that these revenue sources are highly dependent on the health of the overall economy. And as you might imagine, those revenues were hit extremely hard during the height of the COVID pandemic and the economic downturn that, that followed. Uh, the remaining 30% of the revenue are special funds. They come from specific fees that are restricted to specific special services and departments. And we'll dive into that next on the next slide. Special funds can be broken up into four broad categories, which you'll see here, and we'll follow by examples under each one. The revenue each fund can, the revenue from each fund can subsequently only fund related operations and costs that serve special purposes. For example, the zoo. We have the zoo enterprise fund. The revenue in that uh, generates from attendance at the zoo and can only be used to cover the costs associated with the operation, the maintenance, and improvement at the LA Zoo. Similarly, the Solid Waste Resources Fund, the revenue received from refuse collection services can only be used to support the cost of our solid waste collection, our recycling and disposal. Next slide. <clears throat> so now that we have a sense of where the budget comes from, I wanna talk a bit about how it all comes together. And there are several key players involved throughout the process across all of our branches of government. And here I'm gonna highlight four key ones. That's the mayor, of course, who I work with every day, the city administrative officer, the city council, and the chief legislative analyst. But there are a lot of other employees who support the budget process in one way or another. Um, the delivery of a proposed budget every fiscal year is one of the mayor's like, top responsibilities and it's outlined in the city charter, which is like our constitution. Um, that must be done on or before April 20th of each year. And so you typically see, for example, the mayor giving a state of the city address around that time that sort of outlines all of his budget priorities and priorities for the upcoming year. The Office of the City Administrative Officer, or the CAO, um, plays a key role as well uh, throughout this proposed budget. And when it makes its way through the council deliberations, he or she also plays a key role. Um, after the mayor submits his budget, the council must either approve it as submitted or modify it on or before June 1st. And then the chief legislative analyst, who I mentioned before, assists the council in their review of, the, of our proposed budget and then provi provides analyses and reports on impacts of all the decisions that are made during the process. You can go to the next slide. Here's a really high level snapshot of the budget process and the timeline, which we'll cover in a little bit more detail um, in a few moments. But I've highlighted here the key points for engagement, which may be of interest to all of you. Um, there's Neighborhood Council Budget Day, which takes place in July. And December through February is when our office and the budget team is reviewing all the budget requests that come in from our departments. And in April, during the council's consideration of the proposed budget. You can go to the next slide. The, the charter um, it stipulates that the neighborhood councils be consulted in the budget process. So. Neighborhood Council Budget Day is really a great opportunity for elected officials, department reps, and neighborhood council budget advocates to sort of come together and discuss all the areas of concern. Here, the neighborhood councils form smaller working groups to discuss the areas of interest and give suggestions on the budget, which ultimately results in what we call a white paper, which is shared with the mayor's office and the city council. 
And so if you want to get involved um, and learn which neighborhood council you belong to, you should visit empowerla.org slash council. In August, which is only a month into the next fiscal year, the city department start their internal deliberations in preparation to start the budget process for the next year. So we don't really get much of a break. And the mayor's office uh, also gets involved right then to start looking at the priorities and the expectations for the coming year. Uh, one of the first ways our office starts to uh, ensure that the final budget is a reflection of our values is the mayor's budget policy letter. Our office releases that letter in September and that's what officially triggers the process for developing the next fiscal year's budget. Uh, soon after uh, the release of the letter, the CA, I'm sorry, you can go to the next slide. Soon after the release of the letter, the CAO's office releases specific budget directions for departments and they start drafting. Looks like the host muted me, but that's okay. Um, my back on. Got it. Uh, de departmental budgets are due in late November, after which the mayor's office begins to review and the CAO provides some initial recommendations on what we're talking about. At this point in the process, we really encourage people to reach out with input. So you can do that through um, our office, which the mayor has an entire office of area representatives. And to learn more about who your representative is, you can go to lamayor.org slash meet your area representative. You can see that up there on the screen. We can go to the next slide. After a lot of internal, after a lot of internal hearings and iterations with the CAO's office, and of course, after balancing the budget, the mayor delivers his proposed budget to the city council for their consideration. It's at that time that the CLA uh, prepares an analysis of the budget for both the council members on the budget and finance committee to review that and both the mayor's office and the CAO provide their own presentations of, of the proposed budget. In that same vein, every department head has an opportunity to address the committee and raise any concerns they might have on what is included or not included in the proposed budget. At that time, the Budget and Finance Committee then submits their recommendations to the full council. Um, public comment at that time is a really key opportunity for all of our constituents to give their feedback and raise concerns on the budget itself. And then once the council adopts all their own recommendations, the mayor has five working days to veto any changes that the council's made. Also, should the mayor veto the changes, the council has five working days to override the veto if they want to, but we never want that. <clears throat> we can go to the next slide. Now, I know that that was a lot of information um, to go through, so I'd like to focus on uh, the fiscal year 21-22 budget as a case study. And it really was an embodiment of the city's values. Um, and so, you know, uh, we mentioned before the uh, the, the assistance that came from the federal government through the ARP, the American Rescue Plan, and a lot of what we did was made possible by that. So through last year's budget process, we programmed those federal dollars in a way that allowed us to expand COVID recovery. Again, that was like our biggest uh, effort to restore city services and, and importantly, to make really unprecedented investments in addressing homelessness and historic injustices that have faced the city um, you know, for a very long time. You can go to the next slide. Um, sorry, go back one more. <clears throat> back the other way. There we go. So 2020, um, tough year and it's undeniably really difficult for uh, Angelinos across the city. Uh, we were dealing with the pandemic, but we also saw people take to the streets and demand that we really challenge the status quo and what we do in government. Um, in response to that, um, our office convened a lot of meetings with community leaders and folks like yourself representing a wide variety of interests and needs. And across those conversations, there was one really common concern that rose to the top. And that was that communities were really demanding more say in the investments the city made, especially as we look toward COVID recovery. And so as a result of all this really thoughtful engagement, we were able to allocate funding to pilot various programs that help us move the needle 
on achieving equity in communities of color and communities that have suffered from decades of underinvestment. You can go to the next slide. So one program that really spoke directly to that feeling is the LA Repair Innovation Fund. And what it is, is the city's first participatory budgeting pilot. And it's now underway. And it's what it's gonna do is allow residents to generate um, ideas and vote on projects and programs that they feel best address the needs in their communities. And once the votes are tallied and, progr and programs and projects are selected, they'll be funded by city dollars. You can go to the next slide. So this program was designed to uplift nine communities in the city that have historically been the most underinvested. We, as you can see here, we chose community plan areas as sort of the geographic unit to ensure the pilot connects to a larger existing process of participatory uh, planning and decision making. And we set aside $10 million to fund projects that can be submitted by everyday residents who live in those communities and of interest to all of you, also the nonprofits that serve those communities. And you can go to the next slide. Here's a snapshot of some other programs that we recently launched and some of you may have heard about already. There's Big Leap, which is um, America's largest guaranteed basic income pilot to date. It's giving $1,000 a month to close to 3,000 households obligation free. There's Clean LA, which employs young adults, all of whom have faced challenges entering the workforce and they're being tasked with cleaning and beautifying our communities. And in exchange, they're going to receive a salary, but in addition to that, specialized training and certification that will help them get on the path to stable silver service careers in the city. There's the Angelino Corps, which um, we've, <clears throat> pardon me, which we have uh, partnered with a lot of nonprofits on, which provides stipends for 400 students who commit to a year of service um, in environmental justice, community-based wellness and recovery tutoring and mentorship, arts education, immigrant services, and closing the digital divide. And then there are programs founded on our therapeutic and unarmed response for neighborhoods or TURN a program, which is a community-based approach to reimagining public safety, such as the circle teams that re respond to incidents involving homelessness, um, alternative dispatch for suicide prevention, which is a partnership with LA County, uh, DMH, and DD Hirsch. You can go to the next slide. So I want to leave you with a few takeaways, which I think are really key in order to be the effective leaders who can influence the budget. The first thing I want to tell you to do is get informed and stay informed. You should really learn what your city or local government controls when it comes to services and, and programs and know the health of that budget. You know, a lot of times folks don't realize, for example, that the city doesn't have its own public health department. Um, so if you're making public health asks, it might be more appropriate for the county. Um, Second, when you're trying to influence the budget, take more than one bite of the apple. You know, you should know who represents you or the nonprofit that you represent. You know, ask yourself, are there multiple layers within your city government? Know who's at each level and create relationships with those offices and reach out to all of them. For example, a lot of folks don't realize that council offices have discretionary funds, which they can contract with or provide grants to nonprofits in their districts who are either that are located in their districts or who are providing services there. So it really helps if your council member or their staff know your agency, know you, know your mission, know how they might support different efforts that you might be undertaking in their district. The third thing I would tell you to do is to form coalitions that they can really help you amplify your voice. Really make an effort to bring together different groups into the same cause or to rally around a single policy or program. So when you land on what you might ask for, present a very solid, and I have to emphasize a doable ask that falls within the purview of the people that you're talking to. That's only gonna strengthen your case. So before I go, I wanna apologize. I have to run and miss the Q&A, but I'm gonna leave you in the best hands um, that we've got, which is our budget director, Raul Mendoza. He's the one I call when I have questions. So I'm sure that he'll be able to answer anything that um, you missed here or that I didn't touch on. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Artie Mandel, who is the mayor's chief of intergovernmental and legislative affairs. He's gonna to talk to you all about how your organization can apply for state and federal grants. Thank you so much. 
Great. Uh, thanks so much, Andre. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Artie Mandel. I'm the Chief of Intergovernmental and Legislative Affairs here in the Mayor's Office. Uh, my team is, is responsible for all advocacy and lobbying with our federal, state, and local government partners, uh, from the President of the United States down to the LA City Council. Uh, my presentation today is going to focus on how your organizations can access the many state and federal grant opportunities that are available right now as a result of the recently passed state budget and new federal laws like the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to start with a brief overview of the state federal budget process. I'm not going to get as detailed as Andre was when talking about our city budget process, because this presentation is going to focus more on how to access the actual grant opportunities that are now available. Um, but for the state budget, um, in mid to late June, the legislature and governor pass a budget for the following fiscal year, which runs from July 1st to the following June 30th. The enacted budget includes appropriations to the various state agencies and departments to carry out programs or provide funding to cities, counties, tribal governments, and nonprofits to advance programs approved by the legislature. After the budget is passed, those state agencies spend the next few months working to roll out the programs, which includes a few different steps, such as uh, engaging stakeholders to solicit feedback on program design, guidelines, et cetera, releasing notices of funding availability, which are also known as NOFAs, um, soliciting requests for information, requests for applications, and requests for proposals from eligible entities, and finally, reviewing applications. Uh, the timelines for these process vary from agency to agency and program to program. Um, while all this is going on and agencies are rolling out programs enacted in last year's budget, the governor and the legislature are working on the budget for the next year. Uh, the governor released his budget proposal on January 10th, uh, which expands previously approved programs as well as proposes new initiatives. The legislature's budget committees are wrapping up informational hearings to better understand what the governor has proposed and evaluate programs from last year's budget. And in the next two months, the governor will release a revised budget proposal, commonly known as the May budget revision, which will include more precise revenue estimates and more detailed program proposals. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this spring, we're going to see uh, on the federal side, we're going to see federal agencies begin to roll out infrastructure funding opportunities from the recently passed bipartisan infrastructure bill, which was signed by President Biden last November. Uh, similar to the state process, this is going to include a notice of funding opportunities, requests for information from the public, and apportionment to states from formula grants. Um, this will continue over the next year as new programs are established uh, and as fiscal year appropriations are passed to fund the federal government, which also increases funding for the programs that were approved in the infrastructure bill. Uh, a really great resource uh, is the White House one-stop shop, build.gov, which provides information on all of the programs that are included in the bipartisan infrastructure bill. It was a $1.6 billion bill. So there's a lot of programs and a lot of money that uh, has authorized to be uh, granted out over the next five years. Uh, build.gov is searchable, so you can look up opportunities along with new updates to the timelines that programs uh, will be uh, rolled out and information on when applications will open. Uh, next slide, please. So on the federal uh, funding, there are really two different types of grants, formula grants and competitive grants. Uh, competitive grants are also sometimes called discretionary grants, in case you see that word. Uh, formula grants are automatic funding from the federal government almost always directed towards units of government, such as the state, county, and city governments. There are sometimes requirements that uh, entities need to enact in order to access the funding, like submitting an approved spending plan. But because these fundings are uh, designated via formula, they're already apportioned to specific recipients, so it's not a competition to get it. Uh, the formula used to calculate how much funding each eligible recipient gets can be the text of the law, can be left up to the federal agency, or a combination of both. Um, competitive grants are the exact opposite. There is a pool of money and eligible entities must submit an application uh, for them. The federal agency then decides which projects will get funding. Uh, the law provides some considerations for federal agencies to account for when reviewing applications, uh, such as how, such as you know, setting the minimum or maximum funding amounts that can be awarded. Most of these decisions, decisions are up to the implementing federal agencies. Uh, next slide, please. So now I'm going to focus on how to actually access uh, the grant fundings that are available. I'm going to start with state, and um, this can be a little tricky uh, and difficult to follow. 
Thankfully, the state has developed this user-friendly centralized website called the California Grants Portal, uh, which is grants.ca.gov, uh, where you can easily explore funding opportunities. As you can see here, you can filter your search by applicant type. In your case, you'll select nonprofit. Um, you can filter by grant categories, such as education, employment, and labor, food, and nutrition. And then you can filter your search, search by uh, the application deadline. Uh, then you simply select show me opportunities. Um, one thing to note is that um, e even though you can filter and uh, select nonprofit, um, as I mentioned previously, a lot of state and federal funding actually flows through to the city uh, or to the state in, in the federal case. So um, it's often worth uh, searching, uh, running multiple searches and searching for grant funding that is going to the city because then the city will have to decide how to spend that money. And that'll take you back to Andre's presentation earlier about ways to engage with the city through the city budget process because many state and federal grants are uh, actually uh, uh, the decisions about how to uh, fund those are made during the regular city budget process. Uh, next slide, please. So after you select uh, show me opportunities, you'll be taken to a page like this where you can refine the search if you like. Um, you can search for keywords, uh, filter by disbursement method, uh, include programs that are loans rather than grants, uh, exclude opportunities that may, might require matching funds and review programs where, whose deadlines have passed. Um, sometimes, you know, the, the state government will add more funding in the in the next budget year, so it's kind of worth reviewing uh, previous programs too, because they might get more funding in next year's budget. Uh, next slide. So this screenshot is on the same page as the previous slide, but this is what the results actually look like based on your previous selections. As you can see, you have a variety of options to choose from and a number of ways to sort your results. Um, so uh, one example, uh, I talked about this previously, um, is, um, is, look, is thinking about how you want to partner uh, with a city um, uh, to apply for a state grant. Uh, there's a state grant program called the uh, Transformative, Comine uh, Transformative Climate Communities Grant Program. Uh, and the city has partnered with uh, community-based organizations like Bacoima Beautiful to apply for both planning and input implementation grants for that program. So there's a number of programs where partnership with local government is also an opportunity that you should explore. Uh, next slide, please. And then last, if you scroll down to the very bottom of the previous page, you can see a subscribe to updates feature. Uh, this is great as it allows you to sign up for email notifications when newly added grant opportunities uh, pop up in the categories that you've been choosing. So I'd really recommend utilizing this feature so you never miss a funding opportunity and won't find yourself scrambling last minute to put together a solid application. Uh, next slide, please. So now we're moving on to the federal side. Uh, this is grants.gov, uh, the federal government site to access all grants. And you can see in the yellow, uh, uh, yellow squares here on the left side, uh, how to access the search function on the site. Uh, the right picture here shows how you can create an account to submit applications, uh, but you don't need to uh, create an account just to search. Uh, next slide, please. And when you begin to search, you'll see, this is the page you'll see. On the left side, you can see the filters, which are uh, circled in red to help your search. You can select nonprofits under eligibility to see all grants available for nonprofits. And you can also filter the search by the specific federal agency that is making the grant. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, once you click on a grant, this is the uh, type of page you will see. Uh, under the synopsis tab, which is circled in red, you'll get all the, the information about the grant, including the closing date, very important, when the, uh, when the grant application closes, and all of the other eligibility information about the grant. You can see here that we're discretionary, which means it's a competitive grant and not a formula grant um, here as well. Uh, next slide, please. And if you continue to scroll down, you can see uh, the contact information for the grantor if you're having difficulty accessing the grant information electronically. Um, and if you have questions about eligibility, you can see the related documents tab here and download the files. These provide all the additional information about the grant and eligibility, which may answer your questions. Um, the files also have contact information, uh, so you can reach out directly to the federal agency and the grant administrator there. Um, thanks for, uh, uh, for your time today. Happy to answer any questions. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to our Chief Procur Procurement Officer here at the city, uh, Shannon Hobbes. Thanks, Artie. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shannon Hoppus, and I'm the Chief Procurement Officer 
with the Mayor's Office of Budget and Innovation. And my team oversees the overarching technology process and policy as it relates to procurement. So I'm here uh, excited to present the Regional Alliance Marketplace for Procurement or RAMP. Uh, next slide. Oh, actually, we uh, are a little early and talk about how you can use this space to find opportunities for your organization. The city alone spends approximately four and a half billion dollars in construction, various commodity on various commodities, services, construction. And this platform is your first glimpse of how to access those dollars. Next slide. Actually, previous slide, I'm sorry. So what is RAMP? Uh, many of you who have either uh, currently doing or who are currently doing business with us or are in, interested in doing business with the city of LA are probably familiar with the city's old solicitation platform, LA Bavin. This is where a business vendor or nonprofit registers to do business with the city. You in turn receive notices from the city about what we're looking to purchase. This is where the city posts our RFPs or requests for proposals. Ramp fully replaced LA Bavin and went live in February. And why this is important to note is because this is more than just a new platform. We built Ramp to include outside agency solicitations as well. We did it with the goal of making it easier to access multiple opportunities in one place. This is now one of the city's largest public private economic opportunity projects, and it has been a true partnership both in and outside of the city. There has been a strong desire and commitment from our partners to diversify their vendor pools and access more businesses and nonprofit organizations than ever before. This is also why the platform's name was changed to RAMP. It was intended to represent the region's collaborative efforts to support our local economy. This platform centralizes many public and private procurement opportunities. So whether you wanna do business with a city or not, this is the place you would wanna to register to receive opportunities from agencies beyond the city of LA or from departments with the city of LA. The added participation from our partners means that RAMP will be offering a conservative estimate of $10 billion of contracting opportunities within its first year. Next slide. Here you have a look at our current partners who will be posting their opportunities on RAMP. You'll see a wide range of sectors from banking to real estate, sports and entertainment, AEG, the LA Dodgers, other municipalities such as Torrance and Long Beach, engineering and construction firms, as well as hospitals such as Cedar sinai And most re recently, we have also added City of Hope. They are looking for organizations and companies for a variety of work and services, all at different dollar thresholds. We've given our partners the ability to search our database of 80,000 vendors and nonprofits. Our partners will be able to find you by searching against your profiles. And this is a feature that we didn't have in LA Babin, but it is a key feature we provide you with now. We're giving it um, you more of a LinkedIn type of experience where you can talk about your nonprofit what you do, who you've worked with, along with certifications you may hold, or whatever else you may want to list. So if you were previously registered in LA Bavin, your account was automatically moved over to RAMP, but now you'll want to spend time building out your profiles so you can be better matched for businesses that are look, looking to work with you. Next slide. Here we have a summary of five years of contracts awarded to nonprofit organizations. You'll see some of the departments that tend to work more closely with nonprofits. And I do want to note on this slide that it does not in include grant opportunities. Someone might need to mute themselves. Where the city is not the awarding authority and does not include grants awarded by council offices. So now I'm going to hand it over to Andrew to take you through a demo of RAMP. Andrew? Uh, thank you, Shannon. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Choi. I work for Shannon Hoppus on the development of RAMP. RAMP, um, as Shannon mentioned, is our new solicitation platform, and the system is built on four major functions. The first is your ability to search for opportunities. From here, you're going to be able to find opportunities that is best suited for your business. Please use the navigate. Uh, please use the navigation bar above to help organize the information. And I'd like to highlight one opportunity today for many of you may be interested in. Opportunity number three, which is due on May 18th, 2022, shows that the Los Angeles Public Library has put out an RFQ for services in mental health practitioners and family services and advocacy organizations as well. So if you're interested in this specific opportunity, the opportunity ID is 202094. Other features that, as Shannon mentioned, is the ability to create something called a business profile. Your businesses are going to be able to now create a resume online that can be used against uh, used for all of our partners to search your business. Information such as hours of operation, types of services rendered, the mix codes or service areas that you provide, any previous work history you may have, such as this individual has LA City of LA work, um, work with Toyota and other organizations like the County of Los Angeles. This section is very important because as you build out your profiles, our partners, as Shannon mentioned before with that list of businesses, uh, they will be navigating our system and finding you through this information you provide. Finally, um, if you'd like, um, if you need more assistance, we've created a complete support page to help navigate the system as well. How to, uh, how to register for the system, how to update additional documentation, how to up update your business profiles, and how to search for opportunities. So that's a quick update on how to navigate the system. If you need more, if you need further assistance, please visit rampla.org. That is the website, rampla.org, and you'll be able to reach us through there. Back to you, Shannon. Thanks, Andrew. So ultimately, the future will bring a fully digitized procurement process um, of the city's procurement process. Additional filters will allow users to search for opportunities by funding source. And down the line, the city and our regional partners will be able to outreach specifically for nonprofit grant opportunities. We'll also be providing more forecasting so you can be better prepare for upcoming opportunities. And that really speaks to this, uh, the um, points that Andre was making. So at the time of budgeting, when departments get their budgets, we're gonna try and push that information out to all of you so you can better prepare for these opportunities down the line. Next slide. In conclusion, if you haven't already registered on RAMP, please register. If you have not built out your profiles, please do so. If my team may be of assistance, please reach out to us at CPO team at lacity.org. Our contact information, supporting documents and guides are available on rampla.org. And I thank you for your participation. And now I will hand it back to Joni.